This is Tim Bryce with my column entitled, Stand Up for Morality, Part 6 of 8. This is Part 6 of my series on morality, as derived from my new ebook, Stand Up for Morality. In Part 5, we discuss the other institutions affecting morality. Here in Part 6, we will consider some moral problems as an exercise. Let's consider some sample scenarios and determine whether or not they are moral. This can either be done individually or collectively as teams. Allow time for people to think and discuss. Make it competitive if you like. Some are simple, others more complex. All are from real life situations. Problem number one. You happen to find a wallet on the sidewalk filled with a considerable sum of money, but no identification as to the owner. Nobody saw you pick it up or knows you have it. What should you do? A. Pocket the money and discard the wallet, claiming finders keepers. B. Turn it over to the police in case the owner comes looking for it. Take a moment to think about that. The answer is B. Turn it over to the police in case the owner comes looking for it. But the question is why? Why? What is the moralistic rule here? The answer is respect for other person's property. Problem number two. You are a professional programmer with many years of experience. You have just been hired by a new company and placed on a project to write a program. In designing the software, you realize the logic of the program will be similar to another program you wrote for your previous employer. What should you do? A. You finalize the logic of the program and write the code anew. B. Since you kept copies of the programs you have written on a flash drive, you copy the code from your previous assignments. Nobody will know the difference. Take a moment to think about that. Problem number three. You are a parent of a high school senior and naturally you are concerned about the progress of your offspring. You believe your son or daughter to be a good student. However, the student brings home a high C on an important test. You become concerned the grade will cause the student's grade point average to drop, thereby making it harder to be eligible for a certain college. What should you do? A. You call and ask to arrange a meeting with a teacher whereby you ask advice on how the student should work to improve his or her grades. B. You call and ask the teacher to change the grade to a low B. If the teacher refuses, you call the principal and register a complaint about the teacher's competence. Problem number four, you're a patent attorney who has been asked to discuss a new invention as created by a prospective client. You arrange an initial meeting at your office where you discuss the invention. No non-disclosure agreement is signed. The invention is of interest to you as you have a friend who owns a manufacturing company who can build such a product. The invention would be simple to reproduce. What should you do? A, tell the inventor you do not believe it is a viable product. You and your manufacturing friend then jointly apply for a patent for a similar offering. After all, you did not accept the inventor as a client, nor did you sign a non-disclosure. Or B, you inform the inventor you do not have an interest in the product, but provide a reference to another attorney who may be able to help him. The matter is dropped. Problem number five. Commuter traffic is preventing you from getting to work on time. It will also cause you to be late for your weekly meeting where you normally report on the status of your department. You know five other people who will be attending the meeting, all of which are your subordinates. You now realize you will be late for the meeting by at least 30 minutes, maybe longer. What should you do? A. Using your cell phone, you call the office and notify the attendees you will be late. They can either start without you or wait until you arrive. Or B. 30 minutes isn't a long wait. Instead of calling, you decide to focus on driving to work as quickly as possible. Problem number six. You are a clerk in a cigar store. Mr. Smith is one of your regular customers. He appreciates your efforts, and even though he is under no obligation to do so, he always gives you a $5 tip for the cigars he purchases. One day, Mr. Smith is in a hurry, and in signing his credit card receipt, he forgets to add a tip and total. Before you can catch him, though, he is gone. What should you do? A. Knowing he will not mind, you add the $5 tip to the receipt and total it accordingly. Or B. 
you live the tip blank and use the subtotal as the total. Problem number seven. You're a 24-year-old male office worker. You joined a company straight out of college and are enthusiastic about the mission of the business, its products and services. Although your immediate boss is easygoing, the department's senior director is older and very straight-laced. Over time, you begin to grow facial hair, which admittedly looks rough. One day, you decide to wear tattered blue jeans and a t-shirt to work. The senior director stops you in the hallway and admonishes you about your appearance. He instructs you to go home, change clothes, shave, and report back to work. This upsets you as you believe you look fine for the job and being unfairly treated. What should you do? A. Ignore the director and go about your business. Or B. Do as the director instructs. Problem number eight. You are a talented illustrator who produces artwork for magazines and books. A publication has hired you to develop a political illustration. However, you do not agree with the political point of view you are to depict. What should you do? A. Produce an illustration in accordance with the specifications of the publisher. Or B. Produce an illustration that changes the theme of the graphic and expresses your own political beliefs. Problem number nine. You're a well-known and respected newspaper reporter. You have been researching a major story for the last three months. You finally write the article, which has the potential of becoming a whistleblowing expose. You review the article with your editor. Although he thinks you have done an admirable job with the column, he is worried about the political ramifications of the piece, particularly to a politician the newspaper favors. Consequently, he orders you to either change it so it doesn't embarrass the politician or drop it altogether. This offends you as you realize this is an important subject which the public should be made aware of. What should you do? A. Do as your editor instructs. You either change it or drop it. Or B. You give the story to a colleague who has it printed in a competing newspaper. Problem number 10. You're an intolerant anti-smoker. While at an outdoor cafe, you observe a person at the next table smoking, which is legal to do so. You detest the smell and instantly develop a dislike for the smoker. What should you do? A. Ask the smoker to extinguish the cigarette as you claim it bothers you. Should the smoker refuse to do so, you ask the waiter for another table further away from the smoker. Or B. When the smoker isn't looking, you grab the pack of cigarettes and throw it in the trash. And finally, problem number 11. A new mother receives a mailed gift containing two of the same expensive item for her baby. But the shipping invoice indicates the giver was charged for only one item. Clearly, one item should be returned to the store with an explanation of the mistake. What should you do? A. Keep the extra one to give as a shower gift. Or B. Take it back to the store for a refund. And in case you're wondering, both answers are wrong. As much as we might like to do one thing, we must resist temptation in order to fulfill our moral obligation. To some, the temptation is too great to resist. The more frequently we turn away from our moral values, the more our culture deteriorates. Consider the permissiveness of our society today. Was it like this during our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, or great-grandparents' generation? I'm fortunate to have witnessed five generations in my family. Each had their own unique perspective of morality and sense of tolerance. Some of the differences were subtle, such as drinking, smoking, and language. Others were more pronounced, such as their perspectives on citizenship, patriotism, love, assisting others, and so on. The impact of economics, war and peace, played a dramatic role on their lives, as did their participation in organized religion. It is my contention each generation becomes more permissive than the last one due to changing perceptions of the country. What is considered acceptable today may not be considered so yesterday or possibly tomorrow. Ask yourself the question, who was more tolerant, your parents or yourself? And who is more tolerant, you or your offspring? Next time, in part seven, we will discuss simplifying complex moral problems and make some more observations about the properties of morality. 
Stand Up for Morality is an ebook available in PDF, Kindle, and audio formats. All are available through MBA Press. The Kindle version is available through Amazon. Friends, keep the faith. You can find me on the internet at timbrice.com. This is Tim Bryce in Palm Harbor, Florida.